The Great Hunt, book two of the Wheel of Time series, picks up a few months after our last book left off. Rand has been being trained with a sword by Land avidly over these last couple of months, and the story begins with him and Land fighting on top of a tower. During their training, Rand seems to be grabbed by the air around him and held like a man in jello. Well, Land is swinging at him when this happens, and he lands a blow on Rand's side foreshadowing. Lan asks what happens, Ran tells him, and they both kind of go, uh -huh. After the training is done, Lan tells Ran that one day he might need to sheath the sword himself. The subtext isn't really subtle. After this, we learn that the Omerlin Seat, side note, the Omerlin Seat's the head of the White Tower, the leader of the Aes Sedai, and generally regarded as the most powerful political figure in all the land. The Omerlin Seat is coming to the city, and Rand kind of decides that he might need to GTFO before she gets there. He's a man who can channel Doom to go insane, and her and her people are generally hunting and gentling and killing men who can channel. On his way back to his rooms, Rand runs into Matt and Perrin and Loyal, and kind of purposefully initiates a fight between them. Matt and Perrin accuse Rand of being kind of pretentious and trying to make himself into this false noble. Instead of trying to come up with excuses and explain the situation, Rand decides to make it worse so that when he disappears, they won't miss it. Loyal watches this fight happen and gets kind Kind of sad. He's like a puppy watching his owners fight, and he just really wants the peace back. Rand, for various reasons, fails to leave the city before the Amarlin seat shows up, and the guards at the gates won't let him leave at this point. So Rand finds Egwene. She agrees to hide him while the Amarlin seat is in the city. They go to visit Padon Fane in his prison cell. Side note, Padon Fane was captured at the end of the last book and thrown in a prison cell in the basement of this keep. Rand and Egwene go down to the prison cells where the guards are kind of dickish, and Egwene remarks that they used to be nicer and she's not really sure why they're behaving this way. Once they're in the cell, Padon Fane tells Rand that he will make him join the Dark One. Now we shift perspective to Moraine. Moraine has been summoned to visit the Amarlin Seat. While she's on her way, she sees Egwene and Rand together, and Rand's trying to be inconspicuous with her, but failing. Once Moraine meets with the Amarlin Seat, we can clearly tell they're longtime friends, and Moraine and the Amarlin Seat begin discussing current conditions in the world. The fact that the White Tower has fewer Aes Sedai in it than ever, uh, the fact that they do have a few new recruits that are more powerful than any Aes Sedai they've seen in centuries. Elaine Tricand, Egwene, and Nynaeve. From there, the topic of discussion shifts to the fact that they have a secret mission and plan together. Moraine tells the Amarlin Seat that Randall Thor can channel, and she believes him to be the next Dragon Reborn. It's clear from the way they're talking that these two had this plan together, and the Amarlin Seat approves of training Rand to prepare for the last battle. The Amarlin Seat also produces the Horn of Valir. Side note, the Horn of Valir is a magical horn that summons undead heroes back to life to fight for whoever blows it. And the appearance of the Horn of Valir is also the sign that the Dragon Reborn will soon arrive. The Omerlin is also in possession of one of the seals of the Dark One's prison. Problem is, it's broken. This is a sign that the Dark One's prison is weakening because these seals are supposed to be unbreakable. We cut to that night, a Grand is sleeping in Egwene's room, and he is told Egwene has gone off to visit Padon Fane in her cell. An attack happens on the keep that night, and Rand immediately goes to see if Egwene is okay. Rand then gets to the dungeon, and there is blood everywhere. The other prisoners in their cells have all killed themselves or gone insane. There's also a message to Rand scrawled on blood in the wall saying we'll meet on Tomon Head. It's never over, all Thor. Rand begins feverishly scrubbing away this bloody message left to him on the wall, and an Aes Sedai shows up asking him what the hell he's doing. Rand feels strange as she begins channeling at him. This is not allowed what she's doing, and at this point we the readers can infer this is a Black Aja sister. Side note, the Black Aja are a underground secret organization of Aes Sedai that actually served the Dark One. At this point, Moraine walks in, and the Black Sister named Leandrin stops what she's doing. Rand, having no idea what was just done to him, can't really tell Moraine what just happened. Rand then remembers why he's there and runs to Padon Fane's cell, where he finds an unconscious Egwene and Matt. It turns out Padon Fane has successfully stolen the dagger that Matt had and the Horn of Valir. After the attack, the Amarlin Seat summons Rand to come visit her. And with Moraine at her side, the Amarlin Seat tells Rand, you are the next Dragon Reborn. After this, a group is formed to go after the Horn and bring it back. The group is made up of about 20 Shinarans, Rand, Matt, Perrin, Loyal, and a sniffer named Hirin, along with an Aes Sedai no one has really met before. The sniffer, Hirin, can smell violence, and because these are dark friends and Trollocs they're tracing, he's got a pretty good lead on them. 
So the party goes off to go get the dagger and the horn back. We don't want those things in the hands of evil people. On the first night there, Rand is going through his things, and he noticed Moraine put the dragon banner, a symbol for the dragon reborn, in his belongings. Rand doesn't like this. Matt sees it. Matt accuses Rand of being so pretentious and noble, he actually thinks himself to be the dragon reborn. Rand then goes, yeah, I can channel. And Matt and Perrin go, oh, sh They kind of apologize to Rand for the way they're behaving, and they clearly can't even fathom how much pressure Rand is under. Matt and Perrin do have a nice moment, though, of reaffirming their love for Rand. Later on during the hunt one night, Rand falls asleep with his head on a strange stone. Turns out to be a portal stone. Rand accidentally transports himself Self, loyal and Huron into another timeline of the same world. In this timeline, the Trollocs won the Trolloc Wars and all of humanity is dead, and it looks like most of life on the planet is dead. They realize all of this fairly quickly due to Loyal being so well-read and intelligent, and continue on their way. In the first night in this world, Rand is visited by a figure in a black mask with flaming eyes. This figure says he is the Dark One and that Rand must join him. Rand refuses, and after the confrontation is over, thinks he might have just had a dream, but due to the fact that there's now a brand in his palm of a heron to himself holding his sword, he knows it must have been real. Sometime later within this world they are in, a mysterious woman in white appears and begins immediately trying to seduce Rand and tempting him to pursue power. They have been following the same trail this time due to the fact that Huron can still strangely smell the same vile trail, and eventually they find another portal stone for them to go through. They successfully get to the portal stone, Rand channels to get them back to their timeline and succeeds. They then realize that the trail they've been following is gone, and they have actually been following of where the people they've been hunting will be. They then set a trap waiting for the, thief par the thieving party to arrive. The thieving party arrives, Rand and Loyal sneak into their camp, and successfully steal back the horn and dagger. They then flee to the nearest town, which has a giant excavation going on nearby. Rand, walking by this giant excavation, is inexplicably drawn to it and cannot release Sayadeen or the magic within his mind. He's then pulled away, they go into the town, and they stay the night there. This strange woman that's been with them this whole time, named Selene, vanishes and the next day is nowhere to be seen. Rand, fairly sad he's lost his new friend, says they must continue on to the city of Karian. They do, they continue on to the city, and they get an inn there. They decide to wait in the city, thinking it's safe from dark friends, for the remaining Borderlanders and friends to catch up with them. While they are in this city, Rand starts immediately getting letters and invitations from local lords inviting him to their balls. Uh, Rand's response to this, for some reason, is to burn all of the letters in public, saying he's not playing their stupid political games. One day while in the city, Rand also runs into an old familiar face, Tom Marilyn. He actually managed to survive the encounter with the Murdral and has been doing well, except for the fact that he now has a permanent limp. On the way back from meeting Tom, Rand and Loyal are headed back to their inn when they are attacked by Trollocs. These Trollocs somehow manage to blend into the city in a complex way I'm not going to get into. While trying to escape the Trollocs, Rand and Loyal accidentally burn down the entire Illuminators Guild. Side note, the Illuminators Guild are essentially a guild of people who are the only people who know to use explosives and make fireworks. And they then run back to their inn, trying to desperately sit and make sure Huron's okay and the Horn and Dagger are both safe, but when they get there, Huron has clearly been severely injured and the inn is burning down the dagger and horn have been taken back by the Dark Friends. Now we have to snap back to the main hunting party on the day that Rand, Huron, and Loyal disappeared. They all freak out, realizing their sniffer, the one person who can actually keep track of the people they're hunting, are gone, and that's when Perrin realizes he needs to step up. Perrin can still talk to wolves, and he realizes he can communicate to the wolves and have ask them where the people they're chasing are going. He goes up to Ingtar, the head of the party, and tells him what he can do. Ingtar accepts Perrin's abilities, but says don't tell the rest of the party, just tell them you're also a sniffer. They continue to follow the thieves for a long time. The Aes Sedai that's with them seems to be very curious about Perrin and Matt, and continually asking about their paths and Rand. Also on their trip, they run into an Aiel. Side note, Aiel are a warrior-like society that live in a distant land, and we'll get more into them later. We fast forward a little bit, and Perrin realizes Rand has successfully stolen back the horn and dagger. He realizes this because the wolves tell him, and the wolves actually have a lot of respect for Rand. They continue following Rand and his party all the way to the city of Karian. They arrive, go to where they think Rand is staying, and they get there right as Rand comes out of the burning inn, realizing that Huron's been injured and the horn and dagger are gone. Bad timing. Now we need to snap all the way back to Egwene, Nynaeve, and Moraine. 
They're on their way to the White Tower. We learn that Nynaeve has a block that prevents her from using magic unless she is angry. They do begin training immediately though, even on the way back, they are personally taught by the Armorland Seat. It does not go well. We also learn that Egwene might be a dreamer, someone who can predict the future through dreaming and also walk in the world of dreams. During their first few days, Egwene and Nynaeve also meet the daughter of Andor, Elaine, and become fast friends, and they also meet a woman named Min. Min being the same woman who foretold Rand's future back in Book 1. Also, very quickly, Nynaeve is made the rank of Accepted, which is the second level in becoming an Aes Sedai. Leandrin, the Black Aja sister from before, instructs Egwene and Nynaeve to come with her to Toman Head because their friends are in danger there. Min and Elaine also join them for the trip. They travel through the ways and once they're there, of course Leandrin betrays them. She gives them over to the Shan Chan. Side note, the Shan Chan are an invading force from a foreign land that has taken a country and a city called Falma and this is where Toman Head is. The Shan Chan hate people who can channel, collar them with magical collars that prevent them from channeling unless the person holding the leash allows them to. They serve an empress and claim that they have a natural birthright to retake this land since they are the descendants of the last empire that held this land. Min, Elaine, and Nynaeve manage to escape during this handover, but Egwene is taken prisoner and becomes Domani, or a colored one. Snap back to Rand and his group. They learn the horn was taken to one of the actual Lord's palaces, a Lord that Rand has an invitation to go see. So they go to his palace for a party. And Tom is performing there, yay! They quickly realize the horn is no longer there and has left through a way gate. Rand talks to Tom for a bit at this party and a dark friend tells Rand that he must go to Toman Head to meet Padon Fane there if he wants to get the horn back. The party leaves the party Sad side note, we learn after the party that because Tom was seen speaking with Rand, and Rand is such a uh, controversial figure in this city, his current girlfriend has been murdered, and Tom's built-up life here has essentially been destroyed. Our group decides to take a portal stone directly to Tomon Head, so they don't have to do all the traveling and can get there instantly. The Aes Sedai comes up to Rand and tells him she knows he can channel and that he's the only one powerful enough to use the stone. Rand attempts to use it, but unfortunately makes a mistake. Flicker, 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 flicker. What happens is they all live their lives through alternative timelines, taking months and months away from them. And when they finally are teleported to Toman Head, an entire season has gone by. Everyone is severely shaking up, having lived dozens of lives and seeing what horrible or great things they could have done. During this time, Padon Fane arrived at Toman Head, got really close with the Shan Chan and gave them the Horde of Valir. At the same time, Egwene has been being a Damani and being used as a slave, continually beaten into submission. Now that they are finally there, Rand, Matt, Perrin, Ingtar, and a few Borderlander soldiers sneak into the city to try to find where the Horn and Dagger are. Matt is drawn to the dagger, so they use him like a magnet to find where it is, and they sneak into the palace. And of course, it's an ambush. At the same time, Egwene is being rescued by Nynaeve, Min, and Elaine. Rand's group manages to fight off the ambush. Rand is confronted by a blade master of the Shan Chan. Rand manages to actually defeat a blade master by seeking the void, a basically half using magic, half not form of meditation. And during this fight, Matt cuts somebody with his dagger, which he now has back, and the person he cuts turns into a diseased black husk of disgusting. So the party does successfully get out with the dagger after having some pretty gross things happen. And at that moment, a White Cloak army decides to attack the city. They are literally stuck between the Shan Chan and the White Cloak religious fanatics. So to survive, Matt decides to blow the Horn of Valir and summon an army of undead heroes back to life to fight for them. A huge battle ensues, at which point Rand is transported into the sky and he fights the man in the mask with the fiery eyes. Rand manages to stab and severely hurt him, but at the same time Rand is stabbed in the stomach with a black staff and has this horrendous festering wound on his side. Rand falls from the sky and that's the last we see of him. The White Cloaks do manage to push the Shan Chan out and the army of heroes dissipates after the battle is over. Egwene is successfully rescued and now we pick up from the perspective of Min who is drawn to the injured Rand having previously seen him fight in the sky. Min finds Rand unconscious and begins nursing him back to health and talking to his unconscious body. Min tells Rand how much she actually loves him. She has foretold that she will fall in love with him and so will two other women. She has had many visions around Rand and has essentially 
essentially known he's the Dragon Reborn since she first met him. Egwene shows up, clearly jealous that Min has been maintaining Rand in such a way, and goes to fetch Nynaeve, who can maybe heal Rand. Rand wakes up a few days later, hearing that Egwene and Nynaeve and Elaine have been sent back to the White Tower to continue their training, Min is still by his side, and Matt has also been taken to the White Tower to try and hopefully successfully separate him from the dagger. Moraine also arrives at this point and tells Rand everyone saw him fight in the sky. Everyone knows Rand is the dragon reborn and the word is spreading. So that is book two of the Wheel of Time series. I do really enjoy book two. I just don't know why I haven't read it as much. I hope you enjoyed my summary. Uh, please like and subscribe if you have not already. And of course, have a great day. Peace.